Next up on This Week in Law, we've got comedian at law Matt Ritter, Evan Brown, and me. We're going to talk about whether little outsourced antennae are the legal equivalent of great big roof-mounted ones and whether lawyers should drink more. Lots more, too, next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Evan Brown and Denise Howell. Episode 226 recorded September 6th, 2013. Injunction Junction. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the internet the way it should be, anonymous and unfiltered. For 20% off your new account, go to proxpn.com slash twit and enter the code TWILL. Hi, folks. You're joining us for This Week in Law. I'm Denise Howell, and I'm here with my co-host, Evan Brown. Hello, Evan. Hi, Denise. Happy Friday. Hope everything's going well with you. It is. We are in the middle of a bit of a heat wave in Southern California, as our guest this week is well aware. Also joining us is Matt Ritter from Comedians at Law. Hello, Matt. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I'm Going well. So, Matt, uh, tell us a bit, you know, we're not used to having lawyers have a sense of humor. Uh, Tell us a bit about your background and what you're doing uh, with Comedians at Law. So, yeah, uh, long story short, I uh, went to law school on the East Coast at Penn, and then I worked at a couple big firms. I helped destroy the economy. I did subprime mortgage-backed securitization. So I'm partially responsible for the economic collapse. And uh, then I started doing stand-up sort of on the side in New York for a while, and I ended up meeting a couple of other people that were also lawyers uh, and comedians. And... uh, sort of just decided to make the jump full time into comedy. And we started this group called Comedians at Law. We realized that there was uh, nobody gearing their comedy towards lawyers. We, we kind of have a specific, you know, sense of humor. I think it's a little bit different from the general population. So we've just sort of geared our humor towards lawyers. And uh, we tour all over the country to law schools and law firms and bar associations. And we make silly videos and we have a podcast as well. And it's fun. That's great. It's it's much more sort of current and accessible than the humorous law journal that has been around forever in print. Its name is escaping me. Maybe you guys can refresh my memory. I know it has a green cover. Anybody I know remember what you're talking about? What I do. this is called? Uh, but it's it's much more sort of esoteric and uh, uh, big long law review style articles, but written in a funny way. So. Um, Whenever somebody remembers what I'm uh, talking about, please let me know because I, you know, we we lose track of these things over the years. At least I do. Uh, so let's jump right into it. Um, we're going to talk about some funny stuff and some serious stuff on the show today. A uh, big decision from a district court in D.C. that affects the entertainment in- industry. So let's start there first. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about Aereo lately because there are different suits and decisions all over the country considering its business model. You'll recall, uh, hopefully if you're a longtime viewer or listener to the show or if you're just familiar with this area, that Aereo is one of the companies out there that is attempting to stream live television broadcasts Uh, through a very creative technological method using little teeny tiny individual antennae and hard drives assigned to each individual subscriber to the service. Um, So basically what you're doing, what Aereo and others like it argue that you're doing under the law is just outsourcing your antenna function. Uh, You're perfectly in the legal safe zone if you stick an antenna up on your roof and pull in Uh, free over-the-air broadcasting that way. And Aereo claims uh, that, and and, um, Film On, which is the 
other company that's the subject of this current decision, uh, claim that they are doing exactly the same thing for legal purposes. Uh, they're just making it much more convenient and accessible for people who don't want to have to climb up on their roof and have an antenna and manage that kind of thing themselves. Um, so uh, courts have been going back and forth and all around the block on the legalities of this. The um, broadcasters are not happy about it and have sued in various jurisdictions. Uh, here where Matt and I are in California as part of the Ninth Circuit, um, a district court decided no, that's not going to fly. We're not buying it. And um, there is an injunction in place throughout the Ninth Circuit uh, that is against this other company, Film On. And it has effectively prevented Aereo from expanding into our neck of the woods. Uh, meanwhile, across the country in the Second Circuit, which covers New York and environs, um, a, 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 an appellate court, a federal appellate court, uh, found just the opposite, that what Aereo is doing is okay under the law. So we have these different opinions coming out from different courts. And now in Washington, D.C., we've had a federal trial court decide it likes the California position better than the New York position and uh, thinks that this whole, you know, outsourcing your antenna thing is just kind of too cute by half. Uh, hardly akin to an individual user stringing up a television antenna on the roof, writes Judge Rosemary Collier, um, and also finds that the law in question, she thinks, was intended to include all kinds of equipment for reproducing or amplifying sounds or visual images, any sort of transmitting apparatus, any, time, uh, any kind of electronic retrieval system, and any other techniques and systems not yet in use or even invented. So she thinks that Congress really was looking forward to innovative technologies and, and that it, the law... Um, preventing this sort of retransmission uh, would apply to these little antennas. Um, so what Judge Collier has also done, aside from just throw another decision into the mix, is when she issued her injunction, she decided under the law that she could make it nationwide. And she's relying on 17 USC section 502 remedies for infringement of copyright. And uh, that gives judges very broad latitude to grant temporary and permanent injunctions on terms that they deem reasonable pre to prevent or restrain infringement. And it gives them the prerogative to have them uh, have their injunctions be operative throughout the United States. So Judge Collier here did uh, give some respect, some props to uh, the Second Circuit up in New York and say, okay, I'm gonna not make my injunction uh, applicable there, but everywhere else, it is. So um, now the chips fall where they may. This applies to film on. Uh, it doesn't technically apply to Aereo, but since they use such similar technology, uh, they're definitely, um, you know, concerned about this. That's, that's uh, easy to see. Uh, and it will be interesting to see what happens next. Uh, the, the name of film on used to be Aereo Killer, which is kind of ironic here because in the two cases where it has litigated, it has lost. So even if it's not killing Aereo, you know, in a competitive way, it seems to be killing them legally. <laughs> Evan, uh, what do you think happens next? Well, I, I think that, that Judge Collier may have overstepped uh, things here. I mean, first of all, this is an injunction ruling, right? This is a, is it a preliminary injunction? It's not a TRO, right? So it right. looks like she found a lot of facts that maybe it wasn't appropriate to find. You got to remember that when a judge is considering whether to enter an injunction, he or she has to determine whether or not the status quo should be changed. And, you know, sure, there, it's a little bit different in when we're talking about whether or not an injunction should be, or I'm sorry, when infringement should be enjoined. But still, it looks like she really did perhaps more than what was necessary, especially, you know, it, it seems to border a little bit on the rambunctious that she made it nationwide, yet carving out the, the second circuit. So I think that, yes, this is indeed intriguing. This is compelling. It, it tells us, uh, it gives us another piece of the puzzle to try to put into all this. But I wouldn't be surprised if there's some 
more that comes out when you know there are there's some actual fact finding that goes on here after the uh, preliminary injunction stage when the real fact finding is supposed to take place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's still, uh, you know, who knows how all of this will shake out on appeal. So yes, this is uh, important. Yes, this is interesting, but I don't think this is going to do a whole lot to finally resolve uh, the whole larger question of the legality of this new technology. Of course, setting aside how this is the, you know, textbook example of how it makes the Copyright Act uh, look outdated and written well before a time period when uh, technologies like this were were anticipated. So there's much more to this story to get to be written. Okay, so neither of us has anything to do with this case or the lawyers in this case, as far as I know. Uh, so just sort of for fun and pure speculation here, Evan, if you're Ario's lawyer here, uh, what are you doing vis-a-vis -vis film on? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, you're 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 kind of on the same side, but yet you're uh, competitors in the uh, in the space. And it seems like the ultimate outcome of the legal question is going to determine the the environment in which you can be expected to operate in the future. So I think that there's something to be said about forming an alliance, um, even though because the more immediate and pressing question is the survival of the legal environment in which both of you can operate worry about the commercial stuff later, uh, figuring out how you're going to divide the marketplace once it's determined that that marketplace is indeed uh, there and viable and can uh, can exist. Yeah, it does seem like they need to do some sort of survivor-esque kind of alliance where they know they're um, still at each other's throat, but they need to work together for the time being. Matt, what do you think about all this? I, I mean, look, I, I think the cable networks are... You know, I mean, the, the networks are going to do whatever they can to stem their inevitable death, which is impending. And, you know, however these cases get decided, it's just a temporary stay of execution for them because, you know, you, living in L.A., I see it. I'm, we're sort of at the forefront of people wanting their content how they want it, when they want it. Uh, and so everybody's happy about Arrow and, you know, this other film on company. So rooting for them to win. Uh, I also think it's a little contradictory, you know, in the ruling to say that, uh, well, they were forward thinking and considering these tiny little antennas as an extension of, you know, retransmission or whatever, but not considering that uh, forward thinking of, you know, wanting, you, you know, the, the idea that it's totally different from somebody in, going on the roof and putting an antenna up. To me, that's right. no job. Yeah, I have a real problem with that myself. I think, you know, because someone came up with a business model that was creative legally and you know that they considered these statutes very carefully when they crafted their technology. That's the only reason they have little tiny dime-sized antennae. Um, and all they're doing is really, you know, creating a way to capture over-the-air transmissions in a way that's more convenient and efficient for consumers, uh, you know, when I hear something like that, I have to applaud and say, you know, well done, creative, innovation, go get them. Uh, but the judges are um, struggling with it and and distinguishing it from the, net, the antenna that you put on your uh, house because they are centralized and networked and, you know, there seems to be... Um, I think that the judges look at it as, as a subterfuge, you know, that they they look at this and say, well, you know, what you did was really try and find a way to make infringement work and stay, you know, just on the right side of the law while you're doing it. And we're just not going to let you do that. Um, so ultimately, I think it's going to be up to the U.S. Supreme Court because now we're looking at you know, who knows what the Ninth Circuit's going to do with its decision. Uh, they just had oral argument in that case. So um, if they go with the broadcasters, then we have a split between the Ninth and the Second. And that's the kind of thing the Supreme Court uh, will take and look at. Um, if it goes with uh, Film On, then we still have splits in the district courts and that that's not good either. So um, we'll just have to see what happens there. But uh, Evan, what do you think about this whole, you know, too cute by half problem? Do you think that the judge here is trying to squelch legitimate innovation? 
Yes. Um, the part of the judge's rule or part of the judge's thinking on this was that broad statutes should be interpreted broadly. And so um, I, I think that, that, that it's gone too far in giving the uh, breadth that the Copyright Act, the transmit clause uh, requires here. You know, it, it, um, there's nothing in the Copyright Act that really would give the judge much to hang her hat on on this question of whether it's centralized or decentralized. Uh, you know, it's, I, I just, I'm really uncomfortable at looking too much into this. And this harkens back to what I was saying earlier, really uncomfortable looking too much into this in that it was the preliminary injunction stage. Right. I think it's done, we would be, uh, the court certainly would be doing everybody a disservice if it's ruling was intended to um, preempt or somehow cut off real fact finding and real evidentiary work uh, to be done in all this. I think there's there's much more that can be done to uh, illuminate the uh, what what's going on here technologically, showing how it can be uh, done in accord with the with the copyright copyright act, or maybe not. I mean, we're just armchair quarterbacking this Monday morning quarterbacking this, and so uh, well, that's kind of that's what the kind of the nature of a preliminary injunction, right? Because you're just looking at a very limited record. The judge is just looking at a very limited record and and the allegations of the complaint and taking them as true for the, these purposes and deciding whether or not uh, the plaintiff, here the broadcasters, uh, are likely to prevail in their case. And if they have a strong likelihood of succeeding, the court, you know, armchair quarterbacks that and decides, yes, then we're going to enjoin this while the case is pending. And that's what, you know, the appellate courts have to do too when they review the injunction. So uh, we're, we're looking at certainly uh, the Court of Appeal in the D.C. Circuit having to take a look at this and do its own armchair quarterbacking before we ever get to the trial of this case and, and get evidence in. Yeah. So, so uh, that's what's going on there. Uh, it, very interesting how um, this, these tiny little antennas are causing so much legal controversy throughout the country. Uh, also controversial uh, in various parts of the country, including uh, LA and New York until very recently, uh, was the CBS Time Warner dispute, which, surprise, surprise, just in time for football season, uh, managed to wrap itself up uh, with the LA Times reporting that CBS got a very sweet deal. Now, the um, terms of the deal are completely confidential and are not supposed to be disclosed, but uh, the Times apparently spoke to somebody close to the deal who, you know, would not uh, say who they are or how they know things, et cetera, a confidential source, uh, told the Times that, uh, yeah, CBS did really well, um, got, is getting something on the order of twice as much as it used to be getting uh, per customer to be able, uh, for Time Warner to be able to carry CBS programming. Um, so um, I guess now the whole thing where uh, I was really, really surprised that CBS went to the effort of blocking those on a Time Warner internet connection while all this was going on, blocking them from accessing CBS programming online. Uh, now it kind of makes sense to me because I guess CBS is interim goal uh, was to get as many customers mad at Time Warner as possible and, uh, you know, emailing them, canceling service, et cetera, uh, to really put on the heat and, and you know, that tactic and, and all the rest. Looks like it worked out for them here. Uh, Matt, you've been following this. Uh, what's, what's your take on what happened here? Well, you know, I think, again, this goes back to the fact that the future of viewing content is going to be a la carte, potentially. I mean, these these bundles of, of you know, you, you, get, you get these good channels and then you're required to take on 100 crappy ones. I think those days are drawing to a close and, you know, everybody knows it. And, you know, Time Warner is, you know, in a tough spot. So, you know, they don't want to you know, they don't want to get in a position where, you know, they're giving CBS six dollars for for their programming, you know. But then again, CBS brings the ratings, you know, they have they're the high, most highest rated shows. So, you know, I understand where they're coming from. You know, they they pay a lot for their content, you know, I mean, they, they pay a lot for their for their talent over there for every all their shows. They're you know, they probably deserve something on the order of the dollar amount that they got uh, if you were just going to go by ratings. 
you know, but at the end of the day, you know, CBS did the right thing in blocking them out and trying to get people annoyed at Time Warner, I think. You know, Time Warner is, is the biggest loser in this because if anybody cut the cord, uh, they're not going to come back, I think. I think that they're, you know, we're getting into that situation in the world where people who are cutting the cord now aren't coming back. And, you know, I think we're probably closer than we think to, you know, the time warners of the world losing half their subscribers, maybe five years away from losing 50% of the subscribers they have now. So they're in trouble. And, you know, obviously they, they, they ended this before football season, but I think it just goes back to the writing is on the wall for them. And everybody, you know, in Hollywood knows it, I think, and everywhere else in the country will soon too. Well, this is actually related to what we were just talking about with Aereo and film on, because, you know, as, as time Warner and CBS were, hurling uh, various arrows at each other, trying to gain leverage. One of the arrows Time Warner hurled was Aereo uh, saying, you know, you can always get CBS program in if you're in one of the areas where Aereo can operate uh, by subscribing to that. Uh, Evan, are you, uh, tell me your take on the whole resolution of this thing. It's an interesting negotiations problem just to see the huge interests at stake. And I've, I've only looked at it from that uh, um perspective because I'm not in one of the affected markets. And so I haven't really cared at a, at a personal uh, level uh, to the extent anybody cares at a personal level about this stuff. I haven't mm -hmm. worried about uh, being, you know, out in the dark, not getting my, you know, high quality original entertainment uh, through my Time Warner uh, account. Um, but so, but I just look at it as, you know, the, the huge uh, uh, things at, that are at stake here, the leverage that each party was able to have uh, both, you know, substantive when it comes to the content and also in this this huge issue of public concern and the risk of public outrage uh, with the timing uh, in as much as it relates to the uh, beginning of the NFL season. So I'm definitely using this fact pattern, this, this scenario in the, uh, the course I'm teaching on negotiations this coming semester at Kent Law School uh, because of the great way that it, it illuminates how uh, the different interests can can come to um, come to the table and uh, and exert pressure on one another and use time uh, and and outside interest as a way to affect the outcome of, of the resolution of the transaction. Right, and even do things that seem you know counter to their long term best interests, such as that uh, internet online viewing blocking strategy that CBS used here. Uh, because in the long term, CBS wants to be able to go to cable companies and say, hey, we don't need you. We we can go direct to our consumers. They We can give them what they want a la carte. We can make everything they need. They can get everything we have. And why do we need um, a cable company middleman? Um, so You don't. You don't. That's the yeah. answer. You don't. Right. You're not. And the only reason you do is because they control the Internet. Once they figure that out, they are dead. Right. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and make our first MCLE passphrase of the show, Cut the Cord. Uh, if you are listening to this show for continuing legal education credit or any other professional credit, uh, you're, if, and you need to demonstrate that you actually listen to the show, uh, Cut the Cord is our first phrase. We'll drop another one uh, into the show at some random point later on. And if you want more information about getting credit for listening to the show, go to our wiki at wiki.twit.tv, find This Week in Law, and we've got a whole page about the various jurisdictions in the U.S. and how you might be able to get credit there. Uh, and I had to put our... Uh, passphrase in before I play Matt's blackout spoof on the CBS Time Warner dispute, which we're going to do right now. And you'll see why I had to do the passphrase first, because if we'd done the video first, then I would have had to pick an entirely different passphrase that uh, people might not have liked so much. So um, let's let's run that video now if we could. Don't let Time Warner take away television's most original programming. Seaman. Seaman. There must be some kind of way out of here. Said the Joker to the thief. Yeah. There's too much confusion. 
All right. So um, that shows that showed me watching your spoof how little I watch CBS because I only recognized Survivor. <laughs> yeah, showed you more than that. I guess the point of it was you're not missing too much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, and there is more to the video. Uh, you can uh, watch the entirety of Matt's blackout spoof. It, it was a little bit PG-13 for us to run in its entire entirety, as well as uh, all the links to everything we've discussed today. Uh, Eric Gardner has great coverage of the film on decision and uh, that LA Times uh, article on the resolution complete with their source about what CBS is getting paid is really uh, quite a good read too. You can find all that at delicious.com slash thisweekinlaw slash 226 is this episode of our show. Uh, let's move on to some different issues on the copyright front. Uh, Evan, you have been writing about something that comes up an awful lot because of the fact that the web was built in such a way that it's very easy to see how websites are constructed. You just click on view source and there's everything you need to know to make the website you're viewing. Uh, so um, that comes up over and over again where websites look a little too close to uh, one another for people's comfort sometimes. Why don't you tell us what happened in this case? Well, sure. This was a case that, uh, I mean, the back pattern is relatively typical at a general level. Um, one company, in the, and in this situation, it was a company that had a website that provided information for the construction industry, I believe. You know, so folks could go in and look up statutes and get forms and stuff for uh, mechanics liens and, and things like that. And another company set up a website and uh, the, the, the first company uh, alleged that the second company copied the design elements of the, of the website, you know, the color, the font, the style, things like that. Uh, but even more troubling than that, at least in the plaintiff's view, was that it copied verbatim a lot of the actual content, the texts of the, the of the statutes, and also some FAQs that were interspersed uh, within the, uh, the the material that was on the, the, the on both websites. And the, the plaintiff alleged there was some copying there. And so, um, the the defendant moved to dismiss for failure to state a claim in that case, saying as a matter of law, this was the defendant's argument. You know, as a matter of law, the website content and the design uh, isn't even copyrightable. Um, specifically with the content, and this is where the interesting part of the decision was, what the defendant said was, you know, you can't claim a copyright on the texts of, uh, of statutes. Uh, you know, that's that you don't, you don't own the copyright in that. And again, this was just a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim. So the court, uh, you know, similar to, um, uh, you know, what we were talking about this problem earlier, the court didn't do any fact finding uh, in, this, in this situation. Uh, it just looked at the, the pleadings and, uh, and, and found that there was enough here in the complaint to move forward in the case for the, for the plaintiff's case to continue. Um, in fact, this compilation of state statutes was enough to support a claim for copyright infringement because of this idea of what really is a compilation, the selection and arrangement. It wasn't, you know, the whole body of state statutes. It was just those statutes that had a creative, that there was a creative element alleged uh, to to put those together, plus these FAQs that were in there as well. So so what this decision does really is just it reminds us of this problem that companies have of competitors copying website content, and website design. It actually is actionable, and um, you know it provides uh, solace or at least uh, uh, the, a reminder to companies who are uh, plagued by this that there is a, a remedy uh, and indeed a, a warning to those who would try to. Um, uh, to to uh, you know get around the real expense in in web design and web development by simply copying uh, your competitor's uh, website. So an interesting little reminder. Yeah, and it's an interesting wrinkle that uh, it inc it included the point about whether you can copyright laws or not. And and because this was a compilation and a very selective um, cross section of certain laws with uh, commentary about them, right or or some discussion yes. and analysis. Um, so it's a little bit different than the publicresource.org problem we've discussed on the show before where uh, public resources uh, trying to make 
the publicly available laws uh, all together on its site and from time to time gets pushed back from uh, states or other publishers who say, no, 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 we have the rights to those even though they are um, laws and you would think they're not subject to copyright. So uh, interesting point there. Hey, do you guys mind if I jump back a pace to the Aereo Killer slash Film On discussion for a minute? Uh, I, I, what do you think, Matt? Should we discuss <laughs> it first? I, I mean, should you and I decide whether to agree? I hope it's okay because actually someone raised a good point uh, in IRC. Timia in IRC uh, was asking, is Aereo off in Miami now? Haven't used it for a couple of days. Don't want to leave Twill to check. No, don't do that. Um, <laughs> so uh, this raises a really interesting question about um, whether other district court judges are going to honor this sweeping injunction that says uh, we're going to carve out the Second Circuit because we know that the appellate court there has considered this issue and found differently than I feel, I being Judge Rosemary Collier in D.C. Um, so we're carving that out, but every other uh, district in the country, I'd like you, and I'm sitting here as you know a district court trial judge in Washington, D.C., I'd like you to honor this injunction that I am uh, issuing. And I'm wondering if there might not be some district court judges in other circuits who say, well, that's very nice, but I'm not going to honor that injunction because I disagree with you. What do you think, Evan? Uh, just because a trial court judge puts this in an order, is is that any guarantee that the rest of the country will follow suit? No. A couple of things. First of all, it makes it much more entertaining for me to think about this case because every time I think about the judge, I think about Rosemary Clooney. That's at least mm. the image that's conjured in my mind. So that <laughs> Judge Rosemary Collier. But that's really not what yes. the point is, I don't think. No. Um, the way this would work out, I believe, and you know, uh, there I'm sure are some federal civil procedure scholars much more apt to talk about this than, than what I am, but I don't think it would matter what the other district court judges think if the plaintiff in this case thought there was, plaintiffs in this case, thought that there was a violation of this injunction, say when Aereo launches in the Boise market or something right. like that. Um, it won't go to the District Court of Montana to enforce that. It'll just go back to the District Court of the District of Columbia and say, Judge Clooney, I mean, sorry, Judge. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> See, that proves what really is in my mind. Uh, judge, uh, Judge Rosemary, um, you know, really, they are, uh, they are violating the terms of your injunction that you entered here. So enter sanctions here or, um, you know, find them in contempt here. They're subject to the personal jurisdiction, the subject matter jurisdiction of your court. Enter, uh, enter an order uh, throwing the book at them here because of what they're doing somewhere else. That's how I think it would, would play out without the cooperation or the collusion, if you will, of the district court of um, Idaho. Did I say Montana earlier? Boise is in Idaho. Idaho, I'm really, yes. I'm bringing way too much into this, these comments, but you get my point, I hope. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and hopefully nobody goes to Judge Clooney singing Mambo Italiano or anything else. Judge Clooney, now you've got me doing it. <laughs> Call your... <laughs> Collier. <laughs> Isn't it better though when you think of that? It is, of course. Everything's somebody, better with Rosemary Clooney. Judge Clooney in court because of you guys. Yep. <laughs> we're we're happy to take credit and or blame. Um, so yeah, I I think this is going to be um, really interesting as it plays out. Of course, you know, Ario hasn't been enjoined by this court, but uh, they are going to have to make some strategic decisions. Uh, going forward. Matt, what do you think? Do you think we might get a rogue judge somewhere who decides? I, I, you know, it's, it's the thing about these judges, right? I mean, isn't that part of like being a judge? You want to be the rogue judge, don't you? Yeah, you do. I mean, you do. I mean, otherwise, you, you don't, otherwise nobody knows your name. This is true. And they call you Rosemary Clooney instead of Collier. So, <laughs> well, all right. Well, I have to appear in front of her. Yes. Uh, don't we all? All right, uh, let's move back to our other copyright story of the day. And that is that graduated response in the United States is now six months old. 
and uh, in an attempt to get a handle on what kind of impact it's had on uh, infringement and downloading, uh, Torrent Freak uh, decided to see if traffic was down from U.S. users to Pirate Bay. Uh, that would seem to indicate if traffic were down uh, that people were getting educated and or intimidated by six strikes into less frequent use of something like Pirate Bay. And instead, what Torrent Freak discovered, uh, Pirate Bay released some numbers to them, is that immediately after graduated response went into effect, there was a huge spike. So uh, the speculation that Torrent Freak puts in is perhaps all the talk about piracy in the mainstream press piqued the interest of new users. Who knows? I mean, it's inexplicable why there would be this huge spike correlated to that particular point in time. But over the long haul, no traffic from U.S. users to Pirate Bay has not gone down. Uh, they also checked with another uh, pirate-oriented site. Let's see if I can see which one it was. Um, somebody else who gave them less detailed numbers and just said, no, the, U the U.S. U population... Um, continues to use it about a constant level. So what do you think, Evan? Is this a good indicator of whether graduated response is working? Must be. I mean, that because isn't the ultimate uh, goal of graduated response to reduce the incidence of piracy? And these data certainly don't suggest that uh, it's, it's accomplishing that. So without accomplishing the final objective, I think there's no real measure of, of success here. Um, you know, <laughs> It, it is a really fascinating statistic, and it makes me a little skeptical of the data, really, but I have no reason to put any special credence in the data or any special reason to be skeptical of it that, you know, that February 25th, that spike was literally the day after the graduated response was 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 implemented. So, yeah, that's that's definitely interesting. I don't know that um, we can we can extrapolate too much from this, but uh, uh, it's uh, I, I, I don't think that we should find ourselves being really surprised that uh, the, you know, the implementation of the six strikes rule was going to change uh, a lot. You know, there have been several uh, times where in the, in the history of our show, Denise, where we've, we've talked about, you know, new regulatory systems coming into place and waking up in the morning when they become effective and realizing that the sky didn't fall and that the world doesn't look any different. Um, I don't, I don't think anybody has noticed a perceptible difference in the world and uh, especially particularly in the nature of piracy since, uh, since the graduated six strikes uh, policy went into effect. And I haven't gotten any anecdotal evidence either of anything. I don't know anybody who's gotten mm -hmm. notices from their, from their um, ISP. And, you know, given the circles that I run in, the kind of people I talk to, I, you know, would have expected to hear at least some anecdotal evidence. Maybe people in IRC know of someone or have been the subject of that, but I haven't heard hear tell of, of any one that I know being directly involved with, with anything like this, which makes me wonder how aggressively uh, those who are in power to implement the program really are, are doing it. Right. And I think it's something that's going to have to, you can't just look at it six months on because actually that little pull quote from the uh, Torrent Freak article, perhaps all the talk about piracy in the mainstream press piqued the interest of new users. I'd actually be stunned, you know, to if we did a poll and asked people who don't listen to and watch our, our show all the time, uh, if, they've even, if they've even heard of graduated response or know that this new regime is in place, I'd be really, really surprised if there were a high percentage of people who did. I mean, it just seems like it's so under the radar um, and you're going to have to start seeing people affected by it before it starts to impact people's traffic to things like Pirate Bay. Matt, what do you think? I, I think this is the first I've heard of it. So uh, there if you I go. haven't heard about it, uh, then a lot of people are probably not aware of the graduated response. Uh, but I'll say this. Uh, I don't know who the you know, pirates are, but I usually just picture them being college kids. Uh, so I don't see this having any effect on them. You know, mm -hmm. unless unless they start uh, seeing their classmates hauled off in handcuffs. Uh, I just, I don't know, I just tend to think there's a certain type of person who is going to go this route, you know, at this point with how sort of 
how fair, how fairly priced everything is on the internet now. So I'm, I'm not really sure uh, that the people who they want to affect with this will be affected. I, maybe that's why there's no change. I just think that, you know, people with a certain mentality about piracy will have that mentality. And, you know, there's something maybe exciting about the, you know, illicit nature by which they're getting their materials. The sad thing is if there aren't demonstrable ways of showing that piracy is down as a result of graduated response, then the content producers are going to conclude that it's not effective and they're going to want to put more stringent things into place. Um, graduated response is sort of a kinder, gentler way of addressing copyright infringement that starts out with some, you know, not friendly, but at least not or hauling you into court kind of letters uh, and winds up, you know, ultimately you would have to really, really ignore uh, a whole lot of unhappy communications from your ISP to continue to the point where they're going to cut off your service. Um, so Evan, do you think we're going to start to see uh, the industry look to more severe measures? Yes, and that is putting more emphasis in the Video Music Awards to ramp up advertising revenue so that more people can come and look at ads in between acts like Miley Cyrus. That's the future of <laughs> big entertainment. It's the only way around it because that's how the pirates win. Wow, two episodes with Miley and then that's got to be a record for us. It's too, too many. Too, too many. All right. Well, uh, there couldn't be a better time for us to take a break here and thank our sponsor for this episode of This Week in Law. Uh, we're here with Matt Ritter from Comedians at Law, Evan Brown from Info Law Group, and me, I'm your host, Denise Howell. And we wouldn't be here without ProXPN, which if you are someone who is concerned about the graduated response program in the United States or about... Uh, for example, if you're in the UK and you're finding more and more of the sites that you like to visit are blocked uh, either from a uh, court order that uh, has specified that that site might contain infringing activity or uh, other filtering techniques, this is a product you really need to check out. It's a global virtual private network, a VPN, that works with almost any internet connection. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel through which all of your online data passes back and forth. Any online application works with ProXPN, including your web browser, your email, your file sharing, your instant messaging programs, anything that you're going to use on the internet is going to work with ProXPN, except here's what you get. It keeps everything you do online hidden from prying eyes, disguising your physical location and giving you unfettered access to any website or online service, no matter where you live or travel to. So if you are someone who is engaged in uploading and downloading a lot of things and you think that it might get the attention of your ISP, and uh, you just don't want to be caught in that web of communications back and forth with them. Uh, and you know that you're not the person that they're trying to stop. ProXPN is just a great way to get rid of that headache. Uh, it's a great way if you're traveling around the world or just, you know, briefly uh, out of the country and you need to be able to access everything that you access there at home. ProXPN will mask your geographic location and let that happen. It is a complete online privacy tool through its 512-bit encryption tunnel. It works via OpenVPN or PPTP. You get to choose. Protect yourself against that six-strike rule or keep your personal internet usage private at work is a great reason to use a VPN or vice versa if you are using... Uh, if you're working at home and you need to make sure that that data is secure and not subject to anyone who may be engaged in corporate espionage against you, uh, it works for that too. You bypass internet filtering and blocked websites, bypass geographical restrictions for internet content and online video. There are worldwide servers in the United States, UK, Asia, and more. It makes your internet connection region-free 
Uh, it has softwares for Windows and Mac that offers advanced controls, allowing you to select the programs and ports you want to anon anonymously route through ProXPN's servers. It also works with your iOS or Android device, allowing you to use your data plan or public or corporate Wi-Fi with complete and total privacy on the go. There's a new ProXPN app for Android in the Google Play Store that supports OpenVPN. There's world-class customer support. And if you haven't already heard Steve Gibson's take on the product, go check out Security Now 400. He talks about it in great detail and gives it his seal of approval, which is a great thing to have. So go to proxpn.com slash twit for more information and to sign up. ProXPN premium accounts are usually $9.95 a month or $74.95 for the year. But don't pay that. We can do better than that for you. We've got this offer. Use the code TWIL, T-W-I-L, and you'll get 20% off for the lifetime of your account. That's less than 5 bucks a month off the yearly plan. If you're not satisfied, you can cancel within seven days for a full refund. So there's really no danger to you. You should check it out. Go to proxpn.com slash twit and sign up with the code TWIL, T-W-I-L. Thank you so much, ProXPN, for your support of This Week in Law. All right, boys, what else has been interesting this week? Uh, Apple has been interesting. Uh, we have not much talked about the fact that Apple lost its huge uh, ebook price fixing case, but the other shoe has dropped in that case. Uh, where, speaking of injunctions, we seem to be an injunction-heavy uh, show here, but this is the other kind. This is the kind where there was a trial and evidence and witnesses, and it wasn't just a judge ballparking whether a party was going to succeed. Here, the DOJ succeeded rather decisively against Apple, uh, found that uh, Apple was engaged in anti-competitive activities regarding fixing the prices of the books in the iBooks store, and now has issued an injunction that's going to stay in place, a permanent injunction, uh, part of which says that the Apple can impose no ebook price restrictions for four years. So, uh, Evan, what do you think of this, and what do you think happens next? Well, yeah, this is injunction junction. Um, mm -hmm. The... Uh, I mean, I guess it should come as no surprise if in as much as we look at what the evidence was, we looked at the court's uh, findings of fact, you know, at the at the trial and, you know, a permanent injunction seems like uh, a natural uh, remedy to this. So as far as commenting on the on the merits of it, you know, I don't really I don't really know. I mean, there was obviously something going on and there was some pretty compelling evidence to show about how the marketplace actually changed uh, when Apple entered uh, the market and, and did these things and, and that there were some, some heavy-handed uh, tactics like this. But as far as uh, uh, exhibiting any surprise over a, an injunction that has the scope like this, four years, it's really not all that long a period of time in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, there are certainly orders that affect a company's behavior in the marketplace that are more substantial uh, than this. If you look at the FTC's order against Google and against some other companies, I think for, you know, 20 years of privacy monitoring or, you know, reporting back in for 20 years. So a four year type of thing to remedy a harm like this seems quite in proportion to what was alleged and the way that the marketplace actually uh, saw a change uh, because, of, because of Apple's behavior in, in this context. Right. And then the other interesting ebook news this week, um, not really related to this at all, but just a new business model coming out there. Have you seen Oyster yet? No, I thought you were going to talk about the Amazon thing where you can yeah, get... Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I thought we were talking about. Oh, well, let's talk about the Amazon thing. I don't think I've heard about the Amazon thing. What happened there? Do you know more about it, Matt? I mean, it's well, where you can essentially get electronic now, copies. Yeah, I mean, they're now, they now decided they want to get people, you know, it was kind of a mutually exclusive proposition. You get the hard copy book or you get the ebook there, you know, they were trying to figure out a way to get people to want to have both, right. To get you to still want to have that book on your bookshelf, but get the ebook. Cause that's what people are reading now. So they're mm -hmm. now offering all, I think it was all ebooks that you buy the hard copy for, for $1.99 or something like extremely low priced, basically. And it goes all the way back to any book that you've purchased on Amazon for the past 15 years. Oh, that is so fantastic. I know what yeah. I'm doing after the show. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it's it's pretty it's pretty it sounds pretty cool. I don't know if I got that completely right, uh, uh-huh. but I did want to go back to the other convo about the price fixing. You know, I've been waiting yeah. to buy to buy that Harry Potter series. I heard that was pretty good, but now I feel like maybe it'll be accurately priced. I didn't want to I didn't want to buy it at the price that Apple was selling it for before. Right. Didn't your law firm didn't your law firm file some litigation over the effects of Harry Potter? Was that a different context? I thought the comedians at law was was advertising something about Harry Potter. We may have we may have sued Harry Potter. We we see, we we file a lot of frivolous lawsuits, so I'm not right. I, 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 there's I no conflict for, for fun and profit. <laughs> yeah, I can't keep track of all the frivolous lawsuits that we file. That's awesome. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, oyster is uh, well. Uh, as Greg Sandoval wrote up, to brace yourselves for the next wave of products and services that tout themselves as the Netflix of something. This would be the Netflix of ebooks, um, where they are, you know, as Netflix did at the beginning, struggling to get big titles uh, for people to be able to pay a subscription fee and then have access to. But uh, the Lord of the Rings is in there, so that's pretty big and uh, various other things. And it seems like, you know, I mean, who doesn't love Netflix? So it's it's definitely a, an interesting and uh, worthwhile business model. And I think it, in the case of eBooks that if you're someone who reads a lot, um, that does make some sense. I know um, Audible is a big sponsor of our network here. I'm a huge listener of Audible and they don't do, you know, a Netflix type model per se, but when you... Um, you can buy a bunch of credits in advance and that's the way it makes the most sense economically. And I think that's what people want to see with their eBooks is, you know, get being able to access what you want for the best possible price. So um, Oyster is something interesting to watch too. Um, anything else that you guys uh, have been paying attention to this week that seems particularly interesting before we uh, perhaps ponder some uh, legislative issues? No, but you definitely shouldn't have picked Lord of the Rings. Nobody wants to read those. That's, that's crazy long. <laughs> well, mean, everybody wants to read it once, maybe. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been debating whether to read Game of Thrones. You know, that's the big commitment of my life. I'm like, do I want to commit to five years of reading this one fantasy book? I don't know. Oh, I've got, you've got to do it. If you're going to do it, do it on Audible. Because on the, Audible, right? yes, the, the narrator is fantastic and it will not take five years of your life. They're so good. You'll burn right through them in, you know, a month, even though they're huge books. So that would be the way. Then I want to get to, I want to get to choose the, the people's voices. I want to have like Morgan Freeman and Gina Hackman as most of the characters. Oh, <laughs> now there you go. There's a business model. Yeah. Some Turn sort of. Whole life, whole life into a visa commercial. That's great. You know. Yes. Right. Yes, exactly. So here we go. We have to, you know, pay huge fees to people like Morgan Freeman and Gene Hackman for the right to duplicate their voice in some way. And then and, have... and Jennifer Tilly, I like her. She's a very sexy oh, yeah. voice. Who, who was that, Denise, that, you know, a couple of years back was reading the iTunes Terms of Service? Uh, I want to say John Cusack, but I know who was uh, that Oh, actor? God, I forget. That was hysterical. Uh, yeah, IRC, somebody anybody IRC remember? Was, uh, uh, but, no, but that would See? be great if we could come up with the technology to not actually get them, you know, get the celebrity or the the person to to actually do it, but to be able to, be able to generate their voice. That it raises some interesting well, well, right could, of publicity. Right? I mean, look, England doesn't have rights of publicity, right? So why don't they create the technology there? Yes. Yeah. Right. They need to right? do it. Richard Dreyfus. Richard yeah, Dreyfus. I would like that. That's I would right. like that. Actually, I feel like Richard Dreyfus would be nice, like soothing to to talk me to sleep. <laughs> It's like Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> Go to no, the Samuel L. Jackson would be my like wake up, wake up book. Wake the f up. All right, I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> Thanks to Cranium Slows and IRC for coming up with Richard Dreyfus. But you know that that reminds me of coming up with technology to um, generate voices. I saw an interesting article this week about an artist somewhere who goes into public and captures DNA off of random things like cigarette butts and, you know, anywhere that DNA may be found in public, takes it to a biology lab nearby and to the best, uh, you know, based on the best extrapolation from that data, reconstructs a 
uh, a model of what uh, she thinks the the person must have looked like based on the DNA. So the reason I'm bringing this up is, you know, kind of the the way that technology could occasion interesting scenarios for us to ponder the, the right of publicity, because man, that would be kind of freaky to just abandon your DNA in public, have somebody get it and then build this model of what uh, they, what they think that you, that you look like some, some wacky stuff uh, out I'm there. I'm going to wear gloves know. wherever I go from now on. Well, yes. Yeah, so or might as well and, wear and a, a hairnet and a hairnet. I mean, this yeah. is scary. Just wear a body condom. Yes. You know, I that, love that. The naked gun body condom. That's uh, yeah. It's the yeah. best. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I'm not sure where we're going with this. Uh, Terry Hatcher is somebody I would want to generate their voice. We're listening to some, uh, something that she is narrating now. She's really good. She does um, voices very well, changes for the characters and very soothing to listen to. So uh, yeah. yeah somebody be... just wrote, somebody just wrote Patrick Stewart would be great. I think that's a good one too. Yes. I could listen I... to him all day. Definitely. All right. Well, from uh, the ridiculous to the sublime, maybe uh, let's revisit a topic we touched on last week because Matt wants to. Let's go to legislation and policy. Colt 45 is chill by now. <laughs> So uh, we're going to talk about revenge porn and the fact that states seem to be interested in seeing if they can legislate against it. So far, only one state has, the state of New Jersey. Uh, California is considering it, uh, but we talked about that a bit last week. The California statute leaves much to be desired if what you really want to do is discourage people from taking pictures that were initially done between consenting adults and then when the relationship changes somehow, deciding to use them vengefully. The Cal looking at the California statute, and Evan was mentioning this last week, um, it really doesn't get to that scenario, does it, Evan? No, it doesn't. It doesn't do anything about selfies. Was the, what we established last week. It's only when you take when the the photo is distributed, uh, when you have taken it of someone else and then distribute it. You take it. Then but even it. then, if you've taken it with their consent, it seems like you may still not have run afoul of this statute. Sounds like it, but I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not clear and I don't have the text of the statute right in front of me. I, I even forget what it's called. Senate bill to something. 250, 255. Yeah. Anthony Canella so, uh, is its author in California. Yeah. And, so uh, if, you, if, you, if you just Google SB 255, there's plenty of stuff about it on there. I mean, so I don't, I don't have it in front of me right, right. now, but, but I mean, it's the distribution that's the, the real uh, mm -hmm. uh, that that's what's proscribed in 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 the statute, and and so I don't know that it matters too much what's actually in the uh, uh, you know what what's going on right when the photo is taken, because I think arguably there's there would be little question that there was consent to have the photo taken in the scenario that's that's to being addressed here, you know, because the subject is usually smiling or otherwise cooperative, yeah. and the the photo is not like it's been. Uh, surreptitiously taken through a, a peephole somewhere. It doesn't have like the shadow around the aperture. So yeah, I don't know. You know, we, I, I guess we should just bring up the text of the statute before going yeah, into too I, far on this. I'm looking at it and the, um, the statute throughout, both for the, the crime of um, taking the picture, uh, using the, it's either a video or a photograph uh, there's there's all kinds of reference to doing it secretly or to doing it without consent. And then when we get to the um, distribution part, it comes back in there. Uh, this bill would provide that any person who photographs or records by any means the image of another identifiable person without his or her consent, who is in a state of full or partial undress, uh, in any area in which the person being photographed or recorded has a reasonable expectation of privacy and subsequently distributes the image taken, uh, then you're going to have the same penalties as uh, the former part, the earlier part of the statute, which just deals with capturing the images themselves. Oh. Yeah. Um, so it it seems to me that you know you're the scenario we started out with, you know, 
consenting adults. Oh, this will be fun and risque. We'll take some pictures of each other and then things change and somebody decides to get nasty. Uh, that that's, that's not going to be covered under this statute. I guess the California Senate thinks that consenting adults should exercise better judgment than that. And it's so, you know, as you look at this, it's really, I see it more of a, not a revenge porn statute, but just a clandestine photo and video statute. Right. Uh, Matt, you're a California resident. Is this going to impact you? Well, I'm only asking for a friend here. Just, uh -huh. uh, let's just say that. I'm asking for a friend. So let's just say that in all future uh, videos that I make, uh, that my friend makes, I'm sorry, that my friend makes with uh, any girls, if he has them say at the beginning, I, I um, you know, I agree to uh, make this video and you can use it in perpetuity in all media. Uh, how does that, how's that going to hold up? All I know is there's a new Alyssa Milano sex tape that looks pretty good. You ought to check it out. Yeah, I mean, I look. I think hidden. I think making hidden hidden tapes of people is wrong, and uh, you know. But if 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 somebody is dumb enough to make a porn with another person, they better have the only copy of it in their control. That's the answer. People in IRC are telling me I was reading from an outdated version of the bill. Let me see if I can find the current one while we're chatting here. Uh, they're also interested, and in, so am I, in uh, the issue of celebrities. And I think in um, the celebrity instance, you've got really more the problem. I mean, again, uh, if, you, if you're a celebrity and you're letting somebody film you <laughs> in ways that you do not want to be portrayed, um, you just are exercising some really bad judgment. Uh, but I think what more frequently happens there is they get, you know, their face, their image, their likeness gets pasted onto uh, other people's forms and then distributed. Uh, Evan, do you, is that a species of revenge porn or what do you think the, the law is there? Well, I mean, that's uh, when in a fact scenario like that where somebody photoshops somebody else's face or head onto someone else, I mean, I, I, there have been cases where uh, plaintiffs have asserted uh, defamation in that uh, scenario because what you would have there is a statement that the person is engaged in uh, unchaste conduct, uh, if indeed it wasn't true. Uh, and, and so it clearly I think you would have some uh, good grounds for intentional infliction of emotional distress. And I mean, the point being there would be plenty of other civil remedies on the books uh, or plenty of civil remedies that like we've been talking about criminalizing this this now, um, but probably the same factual scenarios would give rise to certain criminal causes of action as well for harassment, um, uh, you know, cyber stalking, depending on the on the statute. Uh, you know, there's been all kinds of new cyber bullying legislation that's been enacted in, in various states. So, you know, I don't think that we're that that victims in this type of situation are completely without remedy. Um, and that's a good thing because, as we've pointed out and have even uh, articulated even more carefully today, that the, the, this California bill, uh, though it's good in, in spirit, doesn't accomplish much in remedying the harms that uh, occur most often in, in these types of scenarios. Yeah, let's talk about the First Amendment ramifications. I just pulled up and I'll put in the... Um uh, discussion points at delicious, delicious.com slash this week in law slash 226 and August 26 uh, report from the Los Angeles Daily News covering the state legislature, uh, the current iteration of the bill and some commentary about that. So what it does and does not cover uh, at the moment should be laid out there. Um, but let's talk about the First Amendment because that's what always comes up when you try and legislate against uh, people publishing various things online. Um, there was a great uh, op-ed piece in CNN by Danielle Citron just saying, please, you know, the First Amendment doesn't apply to this. This is really more akin to harassment. And when it is criminal harassment, there is no First Amendment protection for that. And that's just what we need to clarify, that this is criminal harassment. Am I doing justice to that, Evan? Yes. I mean, of course, Danielle Citron says things so well and so eloquently, but that's the essential point is, look, this is far beyond the, the pale. And it's not unlike other forms of speech that are um, 
indeed unlawful and there's no First Amendment problem with it. And, and you know, in, in these types of situations, what you see is is conduct on the part of the offender here that is deliberately taken to avoid responsibility for this, you know, whether it be a website operator that hosts it uh, in an obfuscated way, you know, is anyone up.com, for example, used IP routing or IP transit services to uh, make it difficult to find out where the content was actually stored. You know, there are plenty of revenge porn platforms that are hosted in the Philippines or Eastern Europe or somewhere outside of the jurisdiction of the U.S. courts. And, you know, they also have like a no takedown policy. So there's all these other indicia that show that it's it's conduct that is uh, clearly articulable as uh, criminal. And it's not unlike other forms of, of conduct, like harassment what, or defamation what about, or I mean, threats. Go ahead. What man. about like, I mean, how is this better or worse than... Uh, I don't know if you heard about this this new app that lets girls rate their ex boyfriends and and talk about them in graphic detail. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think about no, that? But it's, in terms, it sounds in terms like of the a, First Amendment harassment, you know, sort of a line line cross. But first of all, it sounds like a friend of yours may have encountered that app. No, I just read about it on the post. It was, <laughs> it was a bit. It was big big news. Big news out there. I just think that that's, you know, I mean. Porn has this connotation, but I think, you know, some of those sites sort of on their face seem a little less innocent, you know, a little more innocent. But I, I think they, they're pretty much in the same category to me, that they're more harassment than they are First Amendment. It's probably, it's probably helpful for us to talk about the distinction between a law being unconstitutional as applied or a law being unconstitutional on its face. And I think that perhaps when we're, when we're thinking about this and our First Amendment sensibilities get uh, riled up, I was going to say aroused, but I won't say that. When our First Amendment sensibilities get riled up about this, we, we we are just taking this, thinking of it in terms of whether or not regulations, laws like this would be unconstitutional on their face. Um, I, I don't, I think the real problem would be that we need to consider whether or not an, a law like this would be unconstitutional as applied. And that's how it should and it could and should stay on the books because there's such a compelling interest here to protect the victims of these types of situations. But yeah, of course, there's the risk that it'll be too broad. Uh, and that's where the real analysis needs to take place. And so you've got a guy whose girlfriend is putting pictures of his junk out there and writing content about it, commentary, critiques, you know, a review of the performance, if you will, if that if the evidence uh, shows that that is something that's harassing and, you know, causes this kind of harm to that individual person, I see no problem with it being in the province of the judicial system to apply that law in a way that's that's constitutional. If it's something else, uh, if the law is written too broad and it looks to something like community standards or something like that, I think it would be much more difficult. I don't I don't see it as a uh, irresolvable problem. Um, you know, to have the real criminal uh, liability for this while still ensuring that there be First Amendment protection for those cases that aren't, um, that don't rise to that level. Well, Matt, does the app actually uh, present the scenario that Evan just laid out there where where there are unauthorized and and uh, yeah. compromising yeah. pictures? Yeah, I mean, that's what it's out, that, that, I, mean, I don't know about the pictures. I'm not sure, but uh -huh. that's what it sounded, I mean, it sounded like. I, I have and I don't, I don't think I could even access it. I think you have to be a woman to even get on the... Um, <laughs> well, I'll have to do some research then. To get on but, the app. Yeah. Um, yeah, you got to find out you the would. details. Let's see if me <laughs> or Evan are on there. I haven't had an ex-boyfriend in a very, very long time, so all of my information would be very stale. Uh, yeah, mine would be very old, too. I'd be interested to find out what, what the uh, ten, 10 years ago version of me was Yes. Like. But, but be purely for that. research purposes, I would be interested in, you know, is this more akin to is anyone up or hot or not? You know, I mean, or is this just people saying, you know, stay away from this guy, he's a schmuck or or something else. So, I, we had, I mean, we had those in the civil liability. I bet you there'll be a case in the pipeline soon, so we will hear about it. And we had the right. civil liability uh, issues in that, you know, because there was a, uh, you know, Section 230 case a few years ago about don't date him, girl. Uh, you know, so there was there was the lawsuit over that. So, I mean, of course, a different different context. So Section 230 is going to be front and center in, you know, being a bulwark against uh, liability for the provider in, in the civil context for. for right. What happened like in that, that case? I'm curious. It, uh, Don't Date Him Girl was uh, OK under Section 230, you know, as just the it wasn't the provider of the information. It just provided the uh, the, you know, the platform by which 
girls, women would go and, and rate their ex-boyfriends and, you know, do the public service of warning, stay away from this guy. Right. And then if, if the individual users in that kind of scenario, just like with Yelp or any other review kind of site, this sounds like uh, reviews of the dating pool. Um, if the individual user crosses a legal line, then they can be held responsible, but the site itself can't. So um, let's make as applied our second MCLE passphrase for this episode of This Week in Law. And uh, before we leave the, the topic of the First Amendment and these um, revenge porn statutes that various states may attempt to enact, it strikes me that we have someone on the show, Matt, who might be someone uh, who... Uh, you know, if anyone had concern about the overbreadth of this statute possibly impacting perfectly legitimate First Amendment speech, it might be someone like Matt who makes humorous and sometimes PG-13 and above rated <laughs> videos. Um, so, you know, Matt, what would you think about this kind of statute? Do you think it could impact what you do professionally? Um you know, I usually try to use the satire shield of the First Amendment. I feel like mm -hmm. that's always the line that I'm looking. That's the lens th through which I'm looking at most of my videos. Uh, you know, I, I try not to specifically target anyone anywhere near something that it would even, you know, have an argument for harassment. I try to definitely stay way away from that line in, in any of the content that I make. Uh, right. And I'm also, I'm also a reality TV producer, so I'm also like very aware of, you know, sort of the light that I'm shedding on people. And you're a lawyer and you're careful to have people sign ironclad consents when they yes, appear the in your videos, porns, no doubt. For the revenge porns, definitely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully for that <laughs> and uh, for anything else. All right. Well, uh, let's move on unless uh, going, going, gone. Any other uh, topics we haven't gotten to uh, this week before we get to our tip and resource of the week, guys? Anything else All you're good. burning burning to discuss? All good here, Matt. I'm good. All right. Then um, our tip of the week comes courtesy of Matt and uh, it's, it's something that I'm just sad to have to put out there as a tip. It should just be uh, common knowledge and uh, should, you, you wouldn't think you would have to warn people about this. But our tip of the week is particularly if you've just taken the bar exam, never turn down free beer. Can we roll the video? This is great. Hey guys, I'm Matt Ritter and I'm outside of the bar exam and it's over. I'm about to interview the students who just got through this agonizing experience and I brought with me some free beer and some free hugs. Let's go see how they're doing. Free beer, everybody, congrats. Would you like a free beer? Have one. Pass, did you pass though? I think you did, this, this is for you. You want a free hug? Uh, pass. She's yeah. passing on the hugs. I got free hugs too, does That's anybody so need a hug? That's right, the comedians in law. Would you like a free beer? I want a free beer, but can I? Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm taking care of my first customer. There you go. Wow. I'm also giving out free hugs. Oh my God. Congratulations. Congratulations. I've been here before. Thank I've been you. Here. You take a hug? How'd you do? Oh, I'm done. Take I'm going to She seemed nice. Okay. I don't, they were all very nice. <laughs> not, you don't want to get arrested like the day of the bar. You want a free hug? You'll take a hug. Oh, oh, her too. Congrats. Yeah. Some people were weird no, out. I got a paper bag. Yeah, this one right chick here. at the She's end is the really bar. lame. I thought yeah. you deserved it. How'd you do, man? Uh, hopefully well. How blackout drunk are you going to get tonight? I'm going to get blackout drunk for like the I next like like, three, four weeks. Do it for the next three, four like, years. That's yeah, I know, right? Some right? people are commenting We've that I should have checked that right here. <laughs> this is for did, you. Did any dudes I, give you a hug? I'm just a good Samaritan. Would you like one of these, too? No dudes hug me. You don't want a hug? You got your beer. She's happy. Yeah, there's Congrats. No hugs, but you took the beer. I love that. You know what? I'll have one with you. You know what? Okay, that would be awesome. Let's, Let's do it. it. This is uh, your first uh, first drink. Probably. This is right before I got kicked out of it. Let's do it. <laughs> I hope I don't get in trouble. Oh, you no, didn't get that on the okay. No, no. They ran me off the ground. Mm. So That's what success tastes like. Mm. So good. So good. <laughs> Yes, technically, you probably should. You probably violated any number of ordinances, et cetera. But uh, yeah, in order to take the bar, let's hope you're over 21. If not, you're Sheldon Cooper and graduated college when you were 
13 or 14 years old. Um, but the sad, sad thing about that is how many people were just so paranoid and scared. And, you know, I think it's, it's a, a real reflection on what we've been talking about, that everything you do today is recorded and accessible. And, you know, the, maybe the uh, other people are thinking they don't want to be the girl who said, oh, I'm going to go get blind drunk for the next three weeks because yeah. uh, they're, they're going to be unemployable after no, that. That girl but, was awesome. I mean, that's so yeah. silly too. I think 10 years ago, everybody would have taken the free beer. You know, it's so I, silly that I, you can't have that one moment of joy. Yes. I took the bar exam in uh, 1990. And had you been standing outside where we took the bar, my classmates and I would have kidnapped you, would have loved you so much, taking you down the street to some dive bar, like I think it was called Bertola's in Oakland somewhere. Terrible. But they had um, triple drinks for like a buck. <laughs> and we yeah. would have uh, kept you there until you couldn't walk out very That's well. That's what I thought was going to happen. You know, <laughs> the best I could do was a couple of hugs and, a, you know, a couple, couple of swigs. It's yes. hard for a guy today, you know? It's hard. It's hard out there to give out free hugs. Well, all of us in the legal profession, you know, notwithstanding the fact that we have to do continuing legal education on things like substance abuse, we uh, appreciate your support of those taking the bar. And Yeah, you know, this episode, the episode ought to get something for, you know, those states who need, like, whatever substance abuse thing. I don't know. Maybe that's not part of CLE. I'm, it's usually <laughs> not a how-to. It's yeah, usually not a how to abuse kind of scenario that the bars yeah, want. Are, are, yeah. are we remediating <laughs> anyone? That's the question. <laughs> All right. Well, um, our resource of the week, uh, do you remember we featured uh, when Zynga's privacy policy became Privacyville and uh, was set up as sort of a game that you, a game world that you had to navigate through to learn things about the privacy policy and the very, you know, make it more accessible, make it comprehensible. Uh, if we could have Shannon do the visual on this too from the rundown, McAfee has something similar. It's not a virtual world, but it's kind of cool. It's kind of done graphic novel, comic book style, and uh, walks you through their privacy policy with illustrations and in, in plain English telling you exactly um, what information is being gathered, from whom, how it's used, uh, with great graphics and little uh, icons that help you hone in on um, more particular areas you might be interested in. So uh, it's not quite a virtual world, but I like the idea of a privacy policy in graphic novel form as well. Anything you can do to make these things accessible and comprehensible, I think, is a step in the right direction. Uh, Evan, what do you think about all this? I wasn't paying attention, honestly, because I was uh, talking about drinking on the train uh, with the folks in IRC. So, uh, Matt, what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, no, I was also, I love that live feed. It's really funny. There's a lot of uh, characters on there. Somebody said, somebody said that they sensed that I never passed the bar. They said not the actual bar, just a regular bar. A regular bar, yes. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I pass some bars and don't walk into them and drink if it's before <laughs> noon. There you go. On a, on a Friday, though, I don't know. <laughs> I'll be drinking right. early today. Yeah, it's 1239 in California right now. So so you're free to go and it's in. Still, and it, but it's also so hot, right? Isn't that like it's a function of the temperature too? Today you have to have a drink. Yeah, something cold and refreshing. Yeah. But uh, yes, it, it, when I was in law school, and I, it's kind of hokey and I'm sure other schools do this too, but to, to integrate the new students and uh, get them to know one another, there would be bar review, which was not involved in prepping for the bar exam whatsoever. It would be converging at a bar. And uh, I guess it, it, we didn't have Yelp, but maybe we, we would have posted reviews afterwards one way or another, Ho hopefully non-defamatory ones. Um, well, guys, this has been super fun. Uh, yes, it's been great hanging out with the folks in IRC who constantly make us laugh and keep us informed. And today has been no exception. Uh, if you're watching live with us, we do record this show every Friday at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1800 UTC. And you should jump into IRC with us if you're watching live, irc.twit.tv. It's our back channel for the show and it is good fun. Uh, but if you can't do that, don't worry. You can still keep up with the show on your own time. If you go to twit.tv slash twill, we've got our entire archive there. 
um, including uh, the very first episode Evan was pointing out to me that we ever did in video. We couldn't find it there, could we, Evan? Uh, episode no. 23 no. seems to be having an issue, but uh, that was way back in the day. Um, but uh, we were 23 episodes in before we started actually having a visual record of what we were doing, as well as the audio record. Uh, so they're all there, and uh, we'll try and find episode 23. Hopefully it's around the studio somewhere. Um, also, if uh, you like YouTube, we're there too. You can go to youtube.com slash thisweekinlaw. And we love your help in getting the shows ready. Uh, Evan's on Twitter. He's internet cases there. So am I. I'm D Howell there. So sending us links there is a great way to go. Uh, if you're looking for a little bit more discussion around the links, I suggest you go over to our Google Plus page or our Facebook page where we do not have 140 character limits and we can talk about things in a little bit more detail. But whatever works for you, if none of those works for you, you should email us. I'm Denise at twit.tv. Evan is Evan at twit.tv. Either way, we love hearing your own anecdotes. Let us know. If you know anyone who's gotten a graduated response notice, we'd love to hear about that since we're not finding them in our own lives. And uh, I haven't seen any news coverage on it yet. So we're keeping our eye on that or anything else that uh, seems topical uh, related to the things that we discuss on the sh show and the law and policy issues affecting technology that we pay attention to. Uh, we love to hear what you're paying attention to so we can help shape the content of the weekly shows. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and thank you so much, Matt, for joining us and adding a little bit of levity to our proceedings today. Thank you. I had a great time. We did too. And Evan, it's always great to end up the week with you. Makes me feel like uh, I'm right at home and ready to kick off the weekend. Well, the feeling is mutual, Denise. Yeah, lots of fun. Great way to spend a, a Friday afternoon. And Matt, yeah, really enjoyed uh, meeting you and, uh, you know, through this being introduced to your work, which is really, really funny. So I expect to see uh, lots more of you, uh, you know, and, and uh, bigger and, uh, you know, uh, lots of, lots of venues in the future. So yeah, very cool. Glad we could, uh, glad we could connect on the, on the show here. Same here. All right, guys, uh, please join us next week, next week for this week in law. Uh, until then, be careful. Don't drink and drive. <laughs> and, uh, Definitely uh, don't drink and text and drive and all that stuff, uh, or we'll wind up talking about you on the show, and we don't want to do that. So um, be careful out there, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>